gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very thankful for this opportunity that you've given us to continue to study your word together. We're so grateful for your love, your grace, your mercy. We're so aware of just how little we know. We long to grow in grace and knowledge of you. We ask that the Holy Spirit filter out all of that which is foolish, sealing to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi there, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've been studying together in the first epistle to the Corinthians, verse by verse. And in our last study, we had come to uh, somewhere around verse 17. Uh, it's, it's sort of a new section here. And I feel very strongly that we need to remind ourselves in every one of these studies that this is God's Word. Uh, clearly, clearly, Paul wrote it. Uh, clearly, God was using Paul to write it. But God separated Paul from his mother's womb, trained him, uh, diligently trained him for many, many years so that he would be the one that would complete the Word of God. Yet, uh, people continuously go back to Paul's ideas, Paul's thoughts. You know, this is what Paul said. It's what uh, God had Paul say. Uh, so this is God's Word. It's profitable to us for reproof, for doctrine, for instruction in righteousness. So we be begin then at verse 17 of chapter 11. Now in this, that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that you come together, not for the better, but for the worse, for first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it, for there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. Uh, when you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper, for in eating every one uh, taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry, and another is drunken. What uh, I have ye not, have ye not houses to eat and to drink in, or despise ye the church of God and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. Now we saw that that he began this chapter praising the brethren that they remembered him in all things. Now he begins the seventeenth verse, I do not praise you. You don't, you don't come together for the better, but for the worse. So it's, it's that coming together that is the subject of the next few verses. Uh, first of all, when you do assemble uh, as a church, and, and that's the way I'm going to translate that, I hear there are divisions among you, and in, and in part I believe that. The word divisions there is a Greek word that means various groups of people with different ideas who separate from each other. And the 19th verse then goes on, uh, for there must also be heresies. The word uh, here for must is the word uh, die in the Greek. It's you know, de delta, epsilon, iota. Uh, there absolutely must be. It's the must of necessity. Uh, this is the Greek word for the must of necessity. So this word has no doubt in it. It's a, it's a word of necessity. God has made it absolutely necessary that heresies do come among you. And the reason for that is that so that they that are approved may be made manifest. I'm persuaded that none of us ever really, really begin to grasp the seriousness of, of Bible study until we meet somebody that seriously differs with us and disagrees with us. And, and sometimes uh, that can become very uh, combative. And they have ideas which many times are called heresies. I've been accused of being a heretic on more than one occasion. 
The dictionary definition of a heretic is one who disagrees with church doctrine. Uh, well, there's surely churches uh, where you would disagree with their doctrine. I believe the text is using the word here in the sense of those who disagree with God's word, with what God's word says, not what some church says or pastor says or, or anything else. Now, most of you who've watched this channel, you know that I'm somewhat of a fan of grammar and, and, and word meanings, and I'm also, you know, uh, interested in context, and, and, and I, I'm persuaded that most Christians aren't. Uh, I've been asked the same question year after year after year. If, if these things be true, why are there so many that don't believe it? And I don't have an answer for that. Uh, I've met very few Christians who are real serious students of Scripture. You know, they know what they believe. They've heard it. They've sung it. I don't know how they, they got what they believed. And then they look for scripture that supports that and then they ignore everything else. I agree with God here that heresies have to come, that they that are approved may be made manifest. How in the world can anyone say that if you're not careful, you may lose your salvation and go to hell? My Lord said, I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. I mean, did he lie? Well, we know he didn't lie. Uh, he gave me eternal life and I can't perish because he said so. Not because of anything I do, but it's those disagreeing with me that causes me to really dig in uh, to the Word to see if, I, if I'm on the right track when it comes to the truth of what God said, if I'm right or if they're right, if I'm wrong or if they're wrong. And so it has to be a bit of a shock really, you know, to find out that what you zealously believed and proclaimed for years is not true. False prophets shall be there. They will be there. It isn't that we can, get, we can get rid of them. They'll be among us here on this channel that they that are approved may be made manifest among you. When you come together, therefore, in one place or as a church, when you come together in the same place, that is not to eat the Lord's Supper. And I'm sort of stumbling around here because we're reaching in a very interesting uh, passage of Scripture. Now, in, in the past, not too long ago, I covered uh, uh, somewhat of this subject in, a, in another video about what I felt uh, communion was really all about. And maybe that will uh, uh, maybe some of you will remember that. Folks, uh, the last thing I want to do here is shock you people. I, I don't want to shock anybody. I don't want to teach error. I certainly don't want to teach error. I'd rather die than teach error. When you come together, in the same place. You don't do that to eat the Lord's Supper. What do you do? Well, verse 21, For in eating, everyone taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry, and another is drunken. You, you don't come together to eat the Lord's Supper. You're coming together to eat a meal, and you don't even act kindly toward the rest who come. You know, some have a lot of food. Uh, some don't have very much food. Some of them wind up hungry. Uh, some are not. This is not the Lord's Supper. Clearly, the text is saying the Lord's Supper isn't gathering together for a feast. It isn't bringing your food from home and we'll all get together and eat what we brought. Okay? Because of this text, Christian churches over the years, when they, when they have a meal at church, you know, they usually ask people to bring something and they put it on a table and everybody helps themselves so that people don't uh, pack their own lunch and eat it. And one of the basic reasons for that is, is the present text. Christians long ago said, you know, the Holy Spirit pointed out this is not the way to go. So the clear argument of the text is don't call this the Lord's Supper. It isn't. It's just a selfish gathering together of people to eat. Don't you have houses? Verse 20, 22. Don't you have 
houses to eat and drink in. Why in the world would you do it and call it the Lord's Supper? Or despise ye the church of God and shame them that have not. What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. I praise you not. No, he's not praising them because it's, it's an insult to call it the Lord's Supper. Now you can say, well, that's what Paul says. Absolutely. He wrote it, but he didn't say it. God said it. I don't praise you. Why don't you eat at home? In fact, it's going to wind up at the end of the chapter. If any man hungers, let him eat at home. Okay? So I'm suggesting to you that the first thing that we see is that the Lord's Supper or well, whatever you call that, is not a feast. So, now we get into what the Lord's Supper, what it's for, what the Lord's Supper is for. Verse 23, verse 23, For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which He was betrayed, took bread, and when He had given thanks, he broke it, the bread, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. You know, it'd be easy to read this and, and forget all the grammar, forget all the context. And, and I think that's the way a lot of people do that. The Lord Jesus, the same night in which He was betrayed, we know that from the, uh, the Gospels. He's going to leave the upper room. He's going to be delivered into the hands of God's enemies. And He's going to be tried. He's going to be condemned. He's going to be crucified. We all know that. The word bread here, folks, is masculine. And so we have to deal with that. He took bread. And when He had given thanks, He broke that bread and He said, Take, eat. This is my body, and that's neuter. He took bread, and he broke it, masculine. And when he had given thanks, he broke that bread and said, Take, eat, this is my body, neuter. Now, that's what the grammar says. The word body is neuter. What I'm talking about is my body, not this bread. That's, that's why the Romanist you know, says that we actually have the, the elements of the communion table or the Lord's table turn into the actual body and, and, and the blood of Christ so that He's crucified in every Eucharist. And anybody that's ever studied Roman theology uh, knows that an, uh, a curse is pronounced on anybody who says that uh, Eucharist is not a sacrifice. What's the sacrifice? Jesus Christ. So he dies a million times every week around the world. He's re-crucified. And now we have Christians by the score talking about the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. The sacrament of the Lord's Supper. I know of at least one prominent theologian who was almost excommunicated because he said one time he doubted that there were any Christian sacraments. Dearly beloved, the problem with the sacrament is it implies that you gain grace or some merit by the exercise of, of this sacrament. Dearly beloved, the text doesn't say here that this Lord's Supper is a sacrament. And I refuse to use that word. I do not believe it is a sacrament. The big question is, are we commanded to go through some observance or are we commanded to feast on Jesus Christ. All you have to do is go back to John chapter 6. He that eats my body and drinks my blood hath eternal life. And so if you don't do that, you don't have eternal life. What is your nourishment? The body and the blood of Christ. Well, what is he telling us? He's saying that this is what you're going to feast on. This is what you're going to eat. My body not the bread I'm passing out. 
Uh, now, I'm not an expert on Greek grammar, but I'm persuaded you cannot say that this bread represents his body. I, I, I refuse to believe that you can dig that out of the text. So what is the Lord doing? Why didn't he explain that I didn't mean this bread? I meant my actual body. Why didn't he say that? Well, I think he did. Uh, I just, I think he did. Folks, that's what the grammar says. This is my body which is for you, not broken for you. Not a bone of him was broken. The word broken is the bread that was broken. Are, are you following? This is my body which is for you. Why his body? Well, what life would we have? Uh, what nourishment would we have if God Almighty had not become incarnate? If He had not become our kinsman redeemer? It's that body that hung on the cross. It's that body that was placed in the tomb. It's that body that came out of the tomb. And that body speaks of a blood sacrifice payment for sin and resurrection from death to life. This is my body which is for you. You know, I, folks, I have I, I have a hard time even even I just it's hard difficult it really is just to even comment on that. D did did he leave heaven's glory for angels? No, he didn't. Uh, for everybody? No. For animals? No. He left it for me. Me. He didn't become man just as some exercise to do it. He's the only human, and I'm, I'm going to use that word, who was ever born to die. The only reason God Almighty, Creator of the heavens and the earth, the sovereign majesty of, of eternity, the only reason that He took a body was me and you. This is for you, my body. And somehow the Holy Spirit in the text is clearly making a great distinction between the bread, the crackers, whatever he's passing out, and the body of Jesus Christ, which is for me and for you. This do in remembrance of me. Of me. Uh, I'm not sure how many Christian assemblies get together for that today. He's breaking the bread right at that moment. The word broken is, is the bread that was broken. But this is my body which is for you. It's my body and that body is for you. And folks, you ought to dwell on that for a day or two. This do, this do, and it's a present tense. A present tense. So it's something you really do and you accomplish it and you do it in remembrance of Him. And that's why we gather together to feast on God's Word. I determined, the writer of this epistle, chapter 2, I determined to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. His body for you. And I believe that's what we should do. Churches gather together for all kinds of reasons. But how many of them really gathered together, dearly beloved, how many of them really gathered together to feast on Christ? If you said to me, well, you know, we ought to have a video, uh, 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 we need to have a video Lord's Supper, a, a video communion, Steve, that's what we ought to, if, if that's what you said to me, if you said that to me, you know, I'd say, well, that's what we are doing. I believe right now right now I've, I've pointed this out in a, at least one other video we're feasting on the body and the blood of Jesus Christ that is our nourishment okay and if we don't drink his blood and eat his flesh we have no part in him You know, I have no idea what his listeners, his hearers must have thought about that. Those, that sounds so gross, okay? So horrible. To drink his blood, eat his flesh, 
you know, what is this? What are we into cannibalism now? You know what? You know, listen, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for your sin and for mine was the most horrible act of human history. And I rejoice that it was done. I can't imagine in my fondest thinking about it how Christ could ever love me enough to die in my place. But he, he not only did that for me, He did it for you and for all of His own people, all of His people. Isn't it wonderful? Well, to me, it, it is. It doesn't say for all. He didn't die for all. Modern theology in the main, the majority position is that He died for everybody. He made redemption available for everybody. He made it possible. It's up to you whether you take it or not. You know, in one, in one sense, He did die for them. In the sense that He removed Adam's transgression. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That's true. But that is a world system. He loved that system because you were in it. And I was in it. The body that's given in sacrifice was for you, not for all. It was for His people. He came into the world to save His people from their sins. I think that's Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. And we're to remember this in all of our assembling together in, in whatever fashion that happens to be as a church. That's where we are in the context. In remembrance of Christ. I wonder how many churches around the world who, who gathered together this week were basically in remembrance of Christ, His finished work, His person, His work, I mean, how many of them lived on, on the, stood firm on the, I determined to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified? Every single text, folks, speaks of Christ. You search the Scriptures, for in them you think that you have eternal life, but these are they which testify of me. If, if we're coming to this book and it doesn't testify of Him, His finished work, it seems to me that we've missed the point. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, He took the cup. You, you drink it in remembrance of me. He did tell them to take and eat of the bread that He passed out, but He said, this is My body. What you're eating is My body, not this cracker or whatever He passed out. What, what was in that cup? Well, it was wine. All right, It, it couldn't have been unfermented. Uh, I mean, they didn't have refrigerators and freezers back then. It, it, if in fact it was grape juice, then it was just squeezed that day. And you know the upper room and all, and all that was going on at the Passover. They probably didn't go out and gather grapes and squeeze them. So without question, that's why theologians over the years have agreed that it's fermented wine. And we can argue over that, but I, I'd rather not. I'd rather argue over what we know the text says. What does the text say? What does the text say? The text says it isn't a meal. It isn't a feast. You have a home to eat in. You can eat at home. What it is, is gathering together to eat of the body and the blood of the Lord in the same way. The same way. It was, it was bread of some kind. It was probably like they used in the Passover. But he stressed the fact that it isn't the bread. It's my body. That's what I'm serving to you. I'm he I am here telling you that my body is for you. That's the only reason he came. The only reason He suffered, that's the only reason that He died, and the only reason that He rose from the dead is you and me. He took the cup and He said, this cup is the New Testament. New in the sense of quality. That word in the Greek there, it's, it means new in the sense of quality rather than in the sense of time. This is a better covenant. This is a new covenant, and it's in my blood. 
And some people argue that, that blood cannot be used as a synonym for death. But the shedding of the life is in the blood. You know, if he hadn't shed his blood, he, uh, we couldn't say he died. But we know scripturally that life is in the blood. I think that what he's saying here is, is, that, is that this is a new covenant sealed by my blood, which is what I think it means. It's based upon my blood, and I want you to do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And now we go back to the sixth chapter of John. We drink his blood. We eat his flesh. Those are tremendous words. What was the question that they asked when Christ said that? Well, like, how do we drink his blood, blood and eat his flesh? That's the question that came up. That's the question, that question is even asked today. Well, we do it by rejoicing in the fact that that is our spiritual nourishment. That's how we learn. That's how we grow. That's how we mature spiritually by realizing that Jesus Christ is our sacrifice and understanding what that means. Just what He accomplished in our lives. You know, we wouldn't have so many Christians burdened with sin, folks, if they realized the extent of His sacrifice in their place. We wouldn't have so many Christians arguing against a pre-trib rapture if they realized the extent of His sacrifice in their place. Has He forgiven all your sin? Did it, was the price that He paid, was it sufficient? Must He die again? You know, every time you decide to confess your sin, or, or, or is this a finished transaction? His blood's not being shed over and over and over again. We are rejoicing together in the substitutionary death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And we do that because we show forth His death until He comes. Until He comes. That's what we're showing forth. His death. We're not ruling and reigning with Christ in some way. Bringing in the kingdom as many preach today. When we gather together in the Lord's Supper, we're showing forth His death. I personally believe that we're having the Lord's Supper right now together as we feast on Christ in His Word. That's what I believe. You don't have to agree with me, but that's the position that I take on that. We're showing forth His death until He comes. Well, what does that mean? Well, if we believe He's coming again, we must believe He's alive. You know, that's a sober question. Uh, there are many, many professing Christians more than you can imagine who don't really believe that He rose from the dead. They don't. Uh, you know, it's just that's some kind of symbolism. They say, folks, if he didn't rise from the dead, he can't come again. That's pretty much a no brainer. So when we come together, when we gather together, when any of God's people, wherever they gather together, however they gather together, when we gather together to eat his flesh and drink his blood, we are testifying to the fact that He lives. If He's still dead, why gather together and feast on, on, on dead flesh and dead blood? There's no nourishment in that. There's no nourishment in law, folks. There's great nourishment in grace. There's no nourishment, no spiritual nourishment in human merit, a, a religious system based on human merit. Okay? There's great spiritual nourishment in feasting on what Christ did, all that He accomplished on our behalf. 
And that's what we feast upon. The person and work of Jesus Christ. By the very fact that we gather together here to worship Him, to feast on what He's done for us, and praise the Lord for it, is testimony to our belief that He lives and He will return. And then we've got verse 27. To eat and drink unworthily, and we'll pick up there next time, but I will just say this. Alright, let me just say this. You're in church someplace, they're, they're having communion, you take of the bread, you take of the cup, you drink it, and then you immediately, or sometime shortly thereafter, you know, you, you kind of go, I, oh, I wonder if I'm really a Christian. And you've eaten condemnation to yourself. That's not God condemning you. You could be a Christian and not fully understand what Christ accomplished on your behalf, take communion, not be sure of what you're really doing, and you drink condemnation to yourself. We don't want to do that. If you're going to take communion, at least understand what the, the purpose for communion is. At least understand what it is you're remembering. What are you remembering? That you've got to, you've got to work as hard as you possibly can to make it, to get to heaven? Is that, is that what you're remembering? Is that do this in remembrance of of seriously folk come on think about it just think about it i love you all i truly do until next time this is steve thanks for watching